Good morning, everybody. Jay Womack, founder and CEO of Infinity Workforce Solutions. Thank you so much for joining us today. Our webinar will begin in just a few minutes. I appreciate y'all sitting on hold. While we're here waiting for everybody to jump on, I want to give a special shout out to our existing clients that are here with us today. You are proving to your entire workforce that safety is your number one concern, it's your number one priority, and we appreciate that because we are very, very good at delivering training for safety, for orientation, for ongoing corrective action, and you obviously have taken the jump into the company right now and you're using it, you're, you're saying that your people are valuable to you and that's exactly what we want, that's what you want, that's what your people want to hear. So, we do have all the answers. We know exactly what we're doing in web-based training. We've been doing this for 15 years, but I have a special offer today for our prospects that show up. We'd like to offer you a 30-day free trial using our system completely. See what it's all about. See if you like using something like this. You know, remote training has jumped to the forefront of the world. In the last 90 days, the world has shifted, it's changed. Remote training, we are the experts. We know more about remote training than virtually anybody in the entire, I guess, world universe. So I want to offer the 30-day free trial. Time offer is limited. Yeah, we can't make this go on forever. I wish we could. I might even throw in a CSR rep, someone who, a client service rep that can make this thing hum for you, get user activity up on the system because that's the key. Get your people to use the system. I don't care how many bells and whistles you've got, if they're not going to use it, it's not going to have an impact for your company. And at the end of the day, that's what we're all about. We want to see your top line and bottom line improve. We want to see your safety record improve. That's what we do, and we do that better than anybody out there. Thanks for sticking with me. In the meantime, it's what you came for. It's the webinar. So, Mark, if you're ready, I'm going to hand it over to you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you very much, Jay, not only for your uh, support of, uh, of this uh, event, upcoming event, but also your contributions uh, to our industry and the safe driving culture that, that, that you've been able to uh, support so many, so many people out there. So today's July 9th, 2020, and we've got a fantastic webinar today. Um, the theme is, is, is really a very basic, but very much upfront, late won't kill you, speeding will. We've got a great forum today. Uh, I also want to uh, highlight how uh, we will be able to demonstrate industry and enforcement working together for a common goal, which of course is safer highways. We've, uh, my name is Mark Ray. I've got 34 years with, uh, uh, the trucking industry if, with Frozen Food Express, multiple roles, uh, and it's my privilege and I'm honored to host today's event. We've got two men joining us today who have dedicated their careers to developing this industry enforcement coalition, Chris and Chris. The first Chris is Mr. Chris Turner. He's the director of crash and data programs for the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance. Chris has testified before the United States Senate, House of Representatives, Kansas State and House, worked on congressional bills, state laws, federal and Kansas administrative regulations. Chris is a former captain from the Kansas Highway Patrol overseeing the Patrol's Carrier Safety Administration Program, weight enforcement, accident reconstruction teams. He is a drug recognition expert and leading uh, many efforts for a standardized field sobriety test. Chris lives in the great state of Texas, uh, Kansas, excuse me, Chris, and is a graduate of Washburn University School of Law where he just received his law degree. And today he is the primary organizer for next week's Operation Safe Driver Week. So in just a second, we'll have a, 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 a quick Q&A, but I also want to introduce our second Chris. Our second Chris is, is Major Chris Nordlow from the Texas Department of Public Safety. Chris joins us from Austin, where he serves as the coordinator for commercial vehicle enforcement. He's been with the DPS since 1996, worked in El Paso, Falfurious, Houston, Corpus Christi and is currently stationed at headquarters in Austin, Texas. 
Major Nordor is a graduate of Northwestern School of Police Staff and Command and is responsible for developing policies related to commercial vehicle enforcement and oversees the DPS Motor Bureau, Carrier Bureau, as well as the school bus safety program. Major Nordlow maintains close contact with the trucking industry and is related to associations to improve safety on the Texas highways and coordinates enforcement between DPS, FMCSA, and CVSA, and is also the recipient of the 2016 CH Cheshire Award. So we've got two very distinguished uh, career uh, enforcement and industry uh, participants, panelists today. Welcome, gentlemen, and from myself and the trucking industry, a sincere thank you for all you do to keep the roadway safe and showing us an example of how industry, enforcement, and public can, in fact, work together. So I've got a couple of questions before we get into the, uh, the, the presentation, the formal presentation, specifically next week, July 12 through 18, is Operation Safe Driver Week. Uh, Chris and or Chris, could you, could you please uh, detail the focus of Safe Driver Week? I know we talked about speeding and seat belts, but is it, is it primarily designed as a commercial vehicle enforcement or passenger vehicle enforcement? Hi, Mark. This is Chris Turner. First of all, thank you for such a kind introduction. It is, it's truly a pleasure to be with everyone today, and I want to thank everyone who is on the webinar for their dedication and commitment to safety. Something that struck me, and I'll, I'll be remiss if I don't mention it before I answer your question, but uh, in the video, uh, they were, part of your product is talking about the bottom line for motor carriers are out there, and while this week, and I know Major Nordlow and everyone on this call is dedicated to saving lives, there is another aspect to this, and that's, that's the business um, and the bottom line for carriers, uh, financial security for drivers, and especially as, as a lawyer, um, everyone on this line knows that if you're involved in a crash, it's not just the loss of productivity, the injury to your driver, the medical bills, the loss of the load, the insurance claim, but somebody's going to sue you. Um, somebody with, with, you know, like me and the, not only for the ability to save lives, but also for improving that bottom line, there's, there's nothing, um, that can do a better job of that than preventing those crashes. And so for those two reasons, um, this week is so important to CVSA. And to answer your question, the design for this week is to stop drivers who make poor driving decisions. And as you'll see in my presentation, overwhelmingly, when a commercial motor vehicle, a large truck is involved in a crash, that, that sequence of events from which there was no return began because the driver of a four-wheeler made a driving decision uh, behavior which began that sequence of events. So during this week, I can tell you the 13,000 enforcement officers who do commercial motor vehicle enforcement throughout the United States every day uh, and all of their agencies typically participate. So you're getting upwards of 30,000 law enforcement officers are watching around your truck not to stop your driver. Of course, if your driver commits one of these violations, we will, but to make sure that that traffic around that truck is operating safely and when it's not overwhelmingly that's usually the four-wheeler and we stop those vehicles and try and remind that driver what what they did and how to operate safely around that commercial motor vehicle thank you thank you that's uh, uh that's encouraging yes yeah, so we uh, uh, uh the next question i would ask uh, you mentioned four wheelers i, I want to include in this question two wheelers because i've seen some um some rather unusual uh, operational vehicle uh, motorcycle events recently, but uh, on on this causation question, truck car crashes and the critical reason for those for those, do you have any data or observations on uh, causations relative to commercial vehicles versus passenger cars? Absolutely. Um, 
so since the, 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 one of the best studies we can talk about is the large truck crash causation study, which came out in 2000 and two, 2003, ATRI's many studies, state data uh, since that time, overwhelmingly, as well as, as manufacturers, their data overwhelmingly shows that a driver behavior or driver factor accounted for 94% of all crashes. Um, and when we're talking about that, there, you know, we've had tremendous safety gains in the commercial motor vehicle world since the 1980s. And while it still happens that a tire may come off a commercial motor vehicle and bounce across the state or state and hit, it, hit a car or a two-wheeler and a, a tragic loss of life occurs, that's, that's such a minority. Now, we want to make sure those wheels are safe, the, the tubing and the brake hoses, the fifth wheel, the connections, the turn signals, the lights, all those things are still safe. And that's our job as, as mix-app inspectors and Chris's folks, Major Nordlow's folks in Texas. But overwhelmingly, those causal factors are the drivers of, of four-wheelers and, and two-wheelers. And typically, um, and we'll see in my presentation, that 25% of, of all fatality crashes, at least one of the vehicles was speeding. That doesn't mean it was necessarily the causal factor in the crash, but certainly at least one of the vehicles was speeding, and that certainly increases the severity of that crash. And as we go down that list, and I'll, I'll show the results from last year later on, but uh, we see those driver behaviors following too closely, improper lane change, uh, passing and no passing zones, or when it's not safe, something I see all too often in my rural state. So all of those factors are predominantly what's, con what's contributing to crashes out there, and those are the behaviors that we're trying to improve, really improve specifically this week. Well, thank you for that information. And I, I just want to circle back briefly on, on your comment on, on lawsuits. And so, so if the, if the primary causation critical reason for a car truck crash is the four wheeler or the two wheeler, then in most cases you should be able to defend yourself. And obviously uh, uh, Jay is making that offer for complimentary online training, which can, um, clearly support that defendability issue that uh, that we face based on the fact that the majority of these crashes are the four-wheeler and the two-wheeler. So uh, thank you for that information. I've, I, I know the topic, the, the primary uh, theme is speeding, but I've got to ask one question before we dive into the uh, uh, presentation on impaired driver trends and, and, and observations from you two professionals specifically alcohol, marijuana, and what to look for. Can, can y'all give us a little bit of insight on, on that impaired driver issue? Sure, I'll speak to the national one and then and maybe the major would, would speak to some things he sees going on in his state. But nationally and internationally, when we talk about impairment, if we reach back, uh, you know, since we've been tracking crashes, uh, alcohol, our, the one legal recreational drug we had in the United States counted, and that's alcohol up until recently accounted for about half of our fatalities every year. So if we lost 40,000 souls, about 20,000 were alcohol related. Now in 2018, that number was just under, under 10,000 of our fatalities had alcohol on board. <clears throat> what we have done, you'll notice that number is less than half of the fatalities for 2018. But what we've done as a society has created a second legalized recreational drug, marijuana, and a and a large amount of prescription medications. We often think of illicit drugs, but what I can tell you now is NHTSA and CDC, their data shows that drug, drug driving impairment or a driver who's under the influence of drugs, not just alcohol, has risen to the equivalent of alcohol-related crashes. So we're still at a point where about half, our, half of our fatality crashes are in some way related to impairment. And that can be what we normally think of. Um, in Kansas, my last, my last three DREs I did, uh, a little over a year ago now, were PCP. And that may not be the drug you think of first that would occur in Kansas, but that's certainly what we have in the Northeastern United States. Uh, we see a lot of fentanyl uh, that was on the news heavily, especially a couple of years ago, uh, narcotic drugs, um, other places we see stimulants. And my point is that that impairment is significant and it's out there and it's not just those illicit drugs or it's not just marijuana. Uh, we also see a medication for pain, back injuries, most commonly operate or most common in, in folks who drive 
uh, in their careers. I'm sure Major Norlo has, has some trouble with his back. I know that I certainly did uh, when I was working on the road. It's just a, a hazard of being behind the wheel all the time, and those pain medications can be impairing. So, um, and, and what's really disconcerting about impairment, and I'll just use marijuana as the example, is, is back when I began my career, high THC content might have been 3 to 6%. Well, now the THC content you can get from the, the vaping uh, that folks do out there now is upwards of 90% THC. And that impairment can cause you to be impaired for up to 12 hours where you only notice that impairment for six. So all of that to say that, that impairment, uh, when we look at the trend line, even in commercial motor vehicles, it, it mirrors the increase in the fatality line. And, and it's something that, that all of us have to take a very serious look at, be aware of, and train the folks that come into contact with our drivers and law, and law enforcement to, to be able to notice and then take the correct either enforcement action or if you're a supervisor, get that person uh, some testing or at least make sure they don't drive that vehicle. Thank you. That's, uh, uh, the, the trends are, are very clear and uh, it, it's a real issue. And I've, I've got one more question for Major Nordlow. Um, uh, enforcement agencies, specifically the Texas Department of Public Safety, Safety, uh, the Commercial Vehicle Safety Alliance, and the motoring public. Uh, can you describe the relationship between these parties uh, and how it impacts uh, our commercial driving industry? Yes, thank you for that question. One of the things that uh, that we have as a culture within the Department of Public Safety here in Texas is that we work hand in hand with industry. That we 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 uh, in our in our field training officer program and our our training our mix app training and and uh, our overall efforts to communicate and participate in various organizations within DP, DP within uh, the state of Texas and internationally. We uh, we like to make sure that we avail ourselves when we're there to be a, to participate and educate people. Uh, I remember the first time I I testified in front of our our state legislature, and they were asking me about crash causation, and I I basically quoted the same things that uh, Chris Turner did here earlier about how how the percentages of passenger vehicles that are causing these big crashes. You know, it's, it's, it's an, fantastic cover story to have a truck crash and with a big picture in the front and it makes people think that the truck was causing the crash without reading into it and when i when i told them uh, again that the vast majority of these crashes are caused by passenger vehicles uh one of the members actually i'd never heard that before and so I took, I, uh, we have taken upon ourselves to make sure that we educate not, not just the commercial side but the the motoring public that this is what this is a very very important that that we recognize uh, even down to the what you were talking about earlier with the with the lawsuits and whatnot that we educate people that just because of the truck that's caught that's involved in a crash doesn't mean that the that driver was the one at fault or that carrier that was, was at fault not necessarily most of the time is not and that. Uh, that people need to drive safely around them. But, but what, what I do like to do is make sure that we harness the relationships that we have with industry, because that's, what's important. What I often say when I, when I'm in front of a group, my analogy is that, that industry and enforcement are opposite sides of the fence, but we're going the same direction. And you know, we have the same goals in mind that your drivers and the motoring public all have a safe driving atmosphere out there, a safe driving environment. And, and that's what we're here to do. We're here to help. Here in Texas, uh, I, I deal closely with the Texas Trucking Association, the Farm Bureau, the the forest the forest associations. Uh, there, there's a bunch of them here. Cotton, it, it we have a ton of them. The propane haulers, and so they if they have a problem, they seek me out. They they need me my help, and they know that I'm we're not the enemy. We are here to work hand in hand with industry. It's, it's in our interest to make sure that the product gets down the road, that uh, the carriers are safe, that the, the motoring public around them is safe. That's what we're here to do. And we're here to partner with industry. And so we, we take it upon ourselves here at DPS and our local mix app agencies. We have 72 of them 
local agencies here in Texas who also are authorized to enforce motor carrier law, that this is the atmosphere that we strive. You know, we're not, we're not here to be uh, an obstacle. You know, we, we design our inspection facilities to make them as efficient as possible. So we don't stop, you know, we don't slow industry down. So this is the atmosphere that we strive to, to, uh, to give to the to, to industry and the motoring public. This is what we're doing. We're hand in hand. Well, thank you very much. And, and, uh, and, and no, you are not the enemy. And uh, I can't over, overstate that. And it's a breath of fresh air to see a coalition of, of enforcement industry and the motoring public working together. That is, uh, that's hope for the future. Let's say that. So uh, let's, let's jump on into uh, our, our topic for the day, which is next week's uh, uh, Operation Safe Driver Week. Late won't kill you, speeding will. So, uh, Mr. Turner, if you want to flip the next slide, and we'll we'll get specific about that. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> Operation Safe Driver Week is the is the twelfth to the eighteenth of July, and and we've talked about this being an international effort to improve safety and specifically target drivers who are violating the rules of the road. We've talked about how that driving behavior or driver factors contribute to 94% of all crashes. And, and by design, the commercial motor vehicle uh, inspectors, uh, CBSA, uh, the states are concerned with inspections. That's what we do and that's what FMCSA gives us grant money to look out for on a day-to-day -day basis. But this is not our overreaching goal. Our overreaching goal is always safety for everyone who are traveling our, our roadways. Talked about those vehicle components needing to be inspected to ensure that they are, are safe and that we maintain those gains since we've made since the 1980s. Didn't really intend to talk about lawsuits, but and you mentioned it and, and usually the defense about the passenger car works well, but other factors are involved. If for some reason your brakes weren't working as well as they should have now, a part of the contributing percent of that crash may be on the commercial motor vehicle. And that's the carrier or the driver if they didn't inspect it correctly or maintain it. And some states are 50-50 states, meaning you have to have at least 50% liability. Some states are not. So we've been 1% of liability in a crash that that is uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars or a million dollars worth of damage. That's That affects your bottom line. So we have to make sure those components are still safe and, and again, that's what we do most of the time. That's what International Road Check is for. That's what Brake Safety Week is for, Hazardous Materials Lanes. All these are focused on the vehicle or its cargo. This week is not that. This week is about driver behavior. Driver behavior around those large trucks and commercial motor vehicles. The choices that the other driver makes while they're operating that vehicle. I talked about the large truck crash causation study and all the other studies that continue to show that that commercial uh, motor vehicle is not typically at fault. But I will say that when the commercial motor vehicle is, and fault is not the right word, but uh, has the contributing factor that begins that tragic sequence of events from which there is no return, even then, 90% of the time, the driver of the CMV made a poor driving decision. And, and some of our statistics where we, we do cite uh, commercial motor vehicle drivers during this week bear that out as well. So this year, and it should be the slide that's up currently on your screen, we talk about late won't kill you, but speeding will. And, and nothing more true than that. You're just not gonna save any time on your normal drive and your normal run by going a little bit faster. In 2018, over 9,000 people died in speed-related crashes, 25% of all roadway fatalities that year. And we've talked about just even a slight speed increase can make uh, the difference between life and death or a serious injury and a property damage crash. And speeding does continue to be the number one cause uh, or factor rather in those crashes. Doesn't mean it's the cause, but somebody was speeding increasing in severity. And I did a couple interviews uh, and had been pretty, pretty busy this past week and a half. And, and what, Speeding was so timely because while it's always a factor, if you if you pick up the news, um, look at po uh, listen to podcasts or, or just quick seek of the information, you'll see that speeding has increased dramatically this year. So folks uh, in LA or New York, where a normal commute speed might be 
16 to 19 miles an hour well those freeways are now freed up and folks are are easily able to drive the speed limit of 65. You know, across the nation, we've raised those speed limits and, and officers still have a, a tolerance because they can't stop everybody. Um, Ohio, folks are seeing speeds at over 130 miles an hour. Routinely, folks are seeing speeds over 100 miles an hour. Uh, in Toronto, um, they, they on their interstates, were, were citing folks for, for racing and drag racing. And that's, you know, right now, I don't know if it's just that folks believe they can get away with it or it's you know, just a part of their life that they can control right now and normally they can't. So nothing is, is more timely this year than late won't kill you, but speeding will. And while the crashes have gone down, the number of fatalities uh, really is not decreasing with the number of crashes. And that's because while there are fewer crashes when they're at higher speeds, uh, folks are in, in more risk of, of not surviving that crash. So that's the focus of this week and that's why we're out there. We wanna save lives. I don't know a law enforcement officer um, except maybe just the brand new guy right out of the academy who thinks I'm going to stop somebody today to write him a ticket. That's not our goal. And as the major, major pointed out, um, partnering with folks, if we can, if we can interact with people before the crash happens and correct that, that mentality or that behavior that, that they exhibited, that's what we want to do. Goal is not to write tickets. The goal is out there to save lives. So next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about what's going on, and I'll have a chart that, that shows this even better. But if you look at this chart, you can see that in the slide deck from 2015 to 2017, and 2018 bears this out as well, is that large uh, truck crashes um, and bus fatality numbers continue to, to show an increase, and an increase that, that's exponential, and it, the numbers are just staggering. You know, if you look, and, and I'll focus on the number that's probably most critical in the slide, and that's the large truck and bus occupant fatalities up nearly 25% from 2015. If we go back to 2007, which we'll do here in a minute, it's even more than that. It's a staggering number. It's an unacceptable number. And those are the number of the lives lost in large trucks or buses. Uh, if we look at, at the fatalities in large trucks or buses, the actual number of fatal crashes, that's up 14%. But again, because speeding's on the rise, uh, the, the survivability of that at, uh, goes down. So as you can see, and you can take a look back, I'm, I'm sure they can make this, this presentation available, or I'm happy to as well. Um, they're on the rise, they're going our own direction, and this is something we all need to partner and do something about. So next slide, please. So here's where you can really visually see and, and understand what's going on out there. If, if this were actually a, a longer time frame, if we went back to about 2003, or so the early 2000s, what you would see is not just that staggering decline from 07 to 09, um, but a consistent decline in the number of fatality crashes, passenger cars, trucks, the number of lives lost from about 2002, 2003, clear through 2009. Some peaks and valleys, but that trend line was the mirror opposite of what we're seeing and what's on your screen now from 2009 to 2017. Those were tremendous gains. They were celebrated. Everyone was excited. We were moving in the right direction. The drive to zero seemed like something that might be achievable. And it is achievable. But from 2009, and there are um, numerous reasons, we can talk about the number of registered vehicles that are now on the roadway. We can talk about the increase in the economy, so more vehicle miles traveled. But during that same time, you know, safety features increased on vehicles as well. But Something we have not yet talked about is the invention of the iPhone in 2007. And, and many of us take it for granted now, our children certainly do. They've never had to, to rotary dial someone like probably many of you on this phone call have. And someone with, who had too many nines in their phone number, you just said, ah, this may be just not worth talking to them today because that's too long to dial. And I remember that. But things are different. You know, the crash in Colorado that happened about a year and a half ago now where uh, the, the driver was careening down the mountain and not slowing down. Some of our best evidence or, or ability to see what happened in that crash were because folks in passenger cars and four-wheelers um, were blogging while they were driving. They were live video blog because now that is how you, you gain fame or can make your money, the number of followers and numbers of hits you have. 
So impairment speeding, uh, folks on cell phones, uh, just different things have led to this increase and we, and we have to do something about it. And if you look um, from just over 3,000 crashes to nearly 4,500 from 2009 to 2017, and 2018, while overall crashes went down 1%, the number of CMVs involved in crashes went up again 1%, which was just devastating. So there's a number of large truck and bus fatal crashes. If you'll go to the next slide, please. And so what, what does that mean? Well, let's talk about the number of lives lost which is, especially for law enforcement, our, our number one thing we want to prevent. 2009, um, highly celebrated, even though that is a, a terrible, terrible number of souls who are no longer with us, but that was less than 500. And unfortunately now, in 2017, and again, 2018 was, was equally as bad, and 2019 is on pace to be, even with COVID and other things going on out there. We have surpassed the 2007 seven numbers and 2007 was was a rough year it was actually an increase from a couple of years before but now more than a decade later um, nearly a thousand um, occupants of, of large trucks and buses are, are no longer with us and to hammer the point home that's that's mothers and fathers daughters sisters brothers husbands wives parents folks that we'll never get to see again so you know, I know for Major Nordlow and, and all the law enforcement, that is just something that we, we makes us sick to our stomachs and the reason that we're out there doing our jobs. And I know for industry, that's also something that's staggering and something that they want to combat and fight against. And as the major said, uh, two different sides of the fence, but going the same direction, you know, at, at safety and number one priority, but it also takes care of that bottom line for the motor carriers, taking care of your employees and their health and also making sure that, that folks who have that Esquire after their name are, are held at bay. Next slide, please. So let's talk about what we, we saw, and this is pretty consistent year over year, but our 2019 numbers. And the first thing I wanna highlight is what we began our conversation talking about in the first question they asked me, what's this week really about? What are we looking for? Almost, if you look at number one, passenger vehicle drivers, on the left-hand side of your screen, um, quick math, that's what roughly 37,000 citations and warnings for speeding, driving too fast, violation of the basic speed law. Conversely, less than 4,000 for CMV drivers. So this really is a highlight about what we're doing out there this week. And that's, again, stopping vehicles who commit a violation around a large truck, especially speeding. So then they're speeding by your, your large truck or commercial motor vehicle. Those are the folks we're trying to stop. And when a commercial motor vehicle driver does it, we stop them as well and issue that citation, that warning. The discretion is up, up to the, the officer, as it always is, whether or not to issue that citation or the warning. We want to have these positive interactions, but we need to make sure we change that driver's behavior. And it's up to the officer to determine what means is necessary to do that. Tragically, though, if you look at our number two, and, and this is pretty consistent, one, two, three, and, and four year over year is that speeding will be number one and somewhere in two and three will be fair to wear a seatbelt. And last year, that was the same and number two for both passenger vehicle drivers and CMV drivers. Traditionally, CMV drivers have a high rate of seatbelt usage across the nation. We're in the 80s, creeping up on 90%. We were. And then again, that backward slide where we're down to about 86%, 87%. That should be 100%. That should absolutely be 100%. There should never be a commercial motor vehicle driver who's not wearing their seatbelt or passenger vehicle driver. But overwhelmingly, CMV drivers, uh, large truck drivers are professional drivers, and that's their livelihood. And we need to make sure that we're, we're encouraging them and facilitating a change in that behavior so that they're always wearing their seatbelts. Using a handheld uh, phone or uh, texting, um, you know, shockingly, that was number four for CMV drivers. And that one's a little easier to enforce for commercial motor vehicle drivers because you shouldn't have it in your hand. With, with passenger vehicle drivers, uh, it's a little tougher to enforce. One thing I would encourage trucking companies to do is when those laws come up in your, in your states, get behind them and, and support them. They, I've written a few articles on this, uh, one for the National District Attorneys Association, where we talk about how 
how hard those are to enforce. I'll just use Kansas, my home state, as an example, so I don't alienate anyone else. But, you know, our law here in Kansas is an electronic device uh, is, and it talks about, you know, cell phone and, and different ways you commun can communicate. And it says an electronic communication device is not something that can be used for voice operated or one touch dialing. That law was written in about 2007 and that was before you could say, Hey Siri or Alexa or Hey Google. And my, my Siri just said hello to me. Um, so, so we rule in what is an electronic device and then we turn around and rule it right back out under my state law. And we've never taken the opportunity to fix that. And many States allow for um, being able to, to dial a phone number or use it for, for maps or other issues. And, and we really need to be at a place where it just can't be in the driver's hand. And that technology is out there where you can have a Bluetooth device. That's uh, only allows the phone to be operated uh, outside of the reach of the driver, essentially. And that'll save lives and so will other things. But I wanted to highlight that and why that's so difficult for us to enforce in many states. And then, and then finally, I want to talk about uh, the impairment numbers one more time, even on the commercial motor vehicle side. And those are low numbers, and that's good to see, but we need to see zeros there. Possession or under the use of alcohol uh, and or drugs. 55 citations and 18 warnings. Now, uh, you would think, why would somebody ever be warned for that? Some of that could just be alcohol that was in the vehicle where the person wasn't impaired but it was not on on the manifest so they took that opportunity not to write the citation and in some states also have a civil penalty so if they write a citation the civil penalty won't kick in so they're penalized civilly on the other side so that number is is, is more toward 100 percent on the citation or civil penalty side but again those numbers are, are pretty staggering and it's it's not that that necessarily so many folks are driving out there and currently impaired it's it's the the risk associated with it, they are so much more likely to be involved in a crash and then be involved in a fatality crash because, you know, the, the first thing that happens when you, when you take a drink or two or you use that impairing substance is that they impair your judgment. So you are more likely to have another and another and then more likely to get behind the wheel. And this is, this is where you come into contact with law enforcement. We do have those zero tolerance policies. And this is where folks who are safety managers, who are motor carriers, while I know there is so much training and so many things to keep on top of, the new hours of service rules, the ELDs, all of those things, I would, I would offer that this, is, this needs to be one of the top two or three things that you train your folks out there to be on the lookout for, shippers, places where these folks deliver, uh, partnering with rest stops where they can say, hey, I think this person may be impaired. Um, no surefire way to destroy safety or your bottom line that have some, one of your drivers that's in a, in a collision where they were impaired and a contributing factor in it. There's no, there's no way around that. A jury wants someone to blame and that offers up to someone who is very, very easy to blame. Uh, to that end, um, before I prepare to take, take your questions, I'd like to say uh, two more things. Uh, one, I, I'm going to relay something a driver called into a, the satellite radio show I was doing the other day, and he asked, you know, is it worth it to call law enforcement? And he, he called me back personally later that night, uh, had my, my phone number and reached out to me, and he was two for three, meaning that he had called in, he had a radar in his truck, and he could see this, the speed at which vehicles passed him by, and he called in a total of three passenger cars, four wheelers who had uh, passed him, no motorcycles, but uh, those three cars and, and gave the best description he could, told him what violation that he believed he had observed. About 20 or 30 mile posts later, uh, two out of the three were stopped by local law enforcement. And uh, he called back or the dispatch called him back. I don't remember which, but they related to him. Hey, thanks for calling us in. We were able to stop that person for speeding. So you know, I don't know if carriers or drivers maybe maybe feel like law enforcement won't take those phone calls seriously. We absolutely do take those phone calls seriously. We, we look for that description of the vehicle, uh, look for our own reasonable suspicion or probable cause to stop it, and, and we want nothing more to make sure that folks out there are driving safely around you. So we do take those calls seriously, and I would encourage it. And the final thing I would say is, much like Major Nordlow talked about, and especially this week from our point of view, is that collaboration with industry is there, there's nothing better, nothing better at all to improve safety. And, and Texas sets uh, a gold standard for, in many ways. Um, and Major Nordlow has problems that I never had as the commander in Kansas. 
um, because of his size, urban, rural, border, so many different things. But he al- they also set the gold standard for those partnerships. And I, I can't praise uh, the major in Texas enough for that. But those folks that are listening on the line, while we're about out of postcards this year, keep us in mind and please request our CBSA postcards that we showed earlier. Um, give the drivers, ask to leave them at the bulletin board at the rest stop or just leave cards at the rest stop. Uh, email uh, Major Nordlow or your other mix app agent, or maybe just the local police department if they're paid and they're handing out the card or just hi to folks and reminding them to be safe at those rest areas or those truck stops. Uh, email out our press release, provide it um, in your own notifications that you send to your drivers in support of this effort. Remind them to give us a call. Honk when you drive by us on the side of the road. Uh, wave to us. We're, we're out there for you. Uh, give your MixApp agency a call and ask how you can help. Or forums like this where you can touch, you know, a couple hundred thousand people potentially uh, and, and reach out and spread that message. So uh, with that, that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you all so much for your time. There's nothing more important to CBSA and our member jurisdictions than making sure uh, folks on the roadways are safe and Thank you for giving me an opportunity to visit with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chris Turner. That was uh, that was um, very informative. We've got a number of questions here. Hopefully we can get uh, most of them. Uh, uh, before we get to the questions, I did want to uh, give a great big thank you to Mr. Jay Womack, the owner and uh, uh, CEO of Infinity Workforce Solutions and his uh, uh, offer to support through a complimentary 30-day trial uh, of, of the online training. Just as a, I know before the COVID, there were over 250,000 assignments completed uh, per month. I know post-COVID, that number's well in excess of 300,000 assignments. And there is content specifically on speeding and seat belts that can get out uh, this afternoon and tomorrow and this weekend to help your drivers prepare for uh, for the uh, upcoming week. So that being said, uh, I'll just read some of these questions and I'll let Chris and Chris uh, come up with some answers for me. Um, most motor carriers monitor or govern their trucks to 65 miles per hour other than owner operators, which usually can go faster. Uh, when it comes to generally four wheel motorists, I see the average go 10 miles per hour or more over the daily basis. What enforcement enhancements is being done to slow down the four wheel motorists that place our trucks at risk when they cut in and around us? I think you gave a very good description of that, Chris Turner, with your, uh, your callback, but uh, does someone want to jump in and answer that one? Hey, this is Major Nordlow. I'll jump in on that one. Go ahead. Uh, so one of, the, one of the observations that I've had, and, and I've, I've, I've said this in front of groups before as well, is that when we, I've been asked before, what can we do to make our drivers safer? What can we do to make things uh, uh, safer for the motoring public on the road? I've been asked that in, in commercial vehicle forums before. And one of my answers has been, but if you are a carrier who's governed your vehicles because of fuel mileage and or safety concerns or a combination of both, 265 or 67 miles per hour, whatever it is, tell your drivers, if you're on a two-lane roadway, don't take two miles to pass the guy who's going 64 miles an hour because that aggravates all the four-wheelers behind you. You'll get a line of people, and then it just it's just a natural human occurrence. I'm not saying that they're right. I'm just saying that that's a natural human occurrence, that if you're – if, if you got a truck governing at 65 miles an hour and it's being passed by one governor at 67, it's going to take them two miles to pass. And then meanwhile, you've got 30 cars piled up behind you. And that, that's one of the things I would tell the carriers, you know, you express to your drivers that, you know, just be, re, be realistic about your expectations. You know, if you're on a multi-lane roadway, then it's not so bad, but that's one thing. That's one way to address that. It doesn't mean that, the, the car that goes by you 85 miles an hour because he's mad and he's, and he's uh, at, at the driver, you know, at the commercial driver, doesn't mean he's right. But that's just a human thing. And uh, that's something I would tell the motor carriers or the, the drivers out there the, to be aware of that. Uh, and that, that's one way we combat it. It's uh, when we look at cutting and, and cutting in 
uh, passing uh, unsafely and things of that nature, then that's part of what this Operation Safe Driver, and, and in fact, it's our overall focus. When uh, another thing that the, we talk about when I, went, when, when I go in front of the legislature in, here in Texas and they're, they're contemplating adding more agencies to the MIXAP program, they'll ask me, is this going to help? Well, it will help because it's important for large trucks to have good tires. It's important that the, the brake adjustments are correct, that the, the load securement is correct and whatnot. But like Chris was saying earlier, the vast majority of, of these crashes are caused by human error, aggressive driving, distracted driving, impaired driving, fatigue driving, faulty evasive actions, uh, failing to control speed. Those are all human controlled and that's done by both the commercial, commercial drivers and the, the majority of passenger drivers, passenger vehicle drivers. And so when, while, yes, uh, having more truck inspections can help, the, what the average police officer can do out there is enforce basic traffic law, and that's what's going to reduce crashes. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean inspecting trucks. That means uh, doing moving, enforcing moving traffic law. Hope that helps. Yes, sir. That, that very much does help. Um, uh, here's a question from Debbie. This is a great question. How does an officer determine a CMV driver is ill or fatigued? I'm happy to jump in on that one and the major can as well. And I think it's really really consistent. Essentially, a ill or fatigued driver looks much like an impaired driver. So when we go through our field sobriety tests or we notice that something is not, not correct, the driver has slurred speech, blurred vision, um, is, is coordination is, is lacking or failing, you're still going to fail those tests, but we will, we're trained to be able to recognize, okay, this isn't due to drugs and this isn't due to alcohol we have our preliminary breath test and we can make those determinations early on in my career i was just a brand new dre and i i stopped a guy and got him out of the car failed everything miserably but i could tell it wasn't drugs and i asked the driver hey are, you know are you diabetic no i'm not well um you know at that point i said something's going on so i, I raised up the person's shirt sure enough had the the insulin machine i forget what they're called now but they were so impaired from their diabetes and that machine had broken down that that they didn't even realize where they were or who they were got into the hospital hopefully saved their life i certainly got them off the road that night so we all know what ill or fatigue look like you know if we're talking about uh, being in a court of law uh, you certainly have experts who can testify to things but general folks can testify to a lot of things and one of those things are someone's average height whether or not you thought somebody was, well, I'll use the word drunk, because that's a common term that folks can testify to. You know, police officers will use that term to, uh, impaired to, to where they couldn't safely operate a motor vehicle. But that's just something people know. You know when somebody's sick. You know when they're tired. You know when they shouldn't be driving. You know it in your own life. And, and officers know it and can use that common sense on the roadway. And so that's typically how they make those determinations. And, and officers... Um, I do that on a routine basis and they're familiar with it. Thank you. Here, here's another quick question. I know we, uh, we need to keep moving here. How many officers will be out next week? So we've asked all of our member jurisdictions to participate. It varies uh, depending on what's going on. And as we all know, there's a lot going on in the world out there right now, but we have up to 13,000 ish uh, inspectors out there. We've asked that they all participate. We, we know we won't get 100%. There's vacations and other things going on. But in addition to that, many agencies go ahead and task their regular folks to participate as well. And I could just tell you when I was on the road, um, I might stop three to five cars a day plus my normal assignments. But during the week like this when I was tasked, before I was even a truck inspector, you know, your boss would tell you, hey, it's time to, to buckle up and go out and really focus on road patrol this week and those driver behaviors. And my numbers, just as a personal example, would increase to, to 10 to 15 traffic stops a day. So there's more of us out there really paying attention to traffic, which goes to, you know, hey, what are we doing about those other motors who are speeding by yet? And we're more focused, especially in the, during this deployment week, on those traffic behaviors. So 
don't have the number for you uh, for certain, but I know it's uh, well over 13,000 folks that will be participating internationally this week. Well, thank you. And I'll, I'll do some quick math. Uh, we could certainly anticipate plus or minus uh, 50,000 uh, stops a day. So it, it's a significant event, and uh, we certainly appreciate that. Uh, another question here that I can answer is, does Infinity Workforce Solution have – content on speeding and uh, seat belts? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, I would encourage you to get that out to your drivers this afternoon, tomorrow, this weekend. Uh, looking on, on the on the numbers that eliminates, if, you, if you're not speeding and you got your seat belt on, you're, uh, you're well above uh, the average there. So uh, we do have that and that can be done immediately. Uh, Colin, can you put the poll question up for us, please? Or maybe it's up and I can't see it. Uh, anyhow, if you would like to follow up and um, uh, take advantage of the offer that Jay has made, uh, all you've got to do is click the uh, the yes on the poll question and uh, someone will get back with you immediately. We're about, there it is right there. Okay, uh, yeah, just hit the yes if you want a copy of this, if you want somebody to communicate with you. Anything to follow up on, uh, press yes. Uh, I think we've given the, con do we have the contacts for Major Nordlow and Mr. Chris Turner? There they are right there, okay. Uh, I wanna make sure you got that. There's a couple of other questions. We're just not gonna be able to get to them. Uh, we'll try to answer them uh, uh, verbally. Uh, if you would like to take Jay up on his offer for the 30-day complimentary trial, just press the yes. If you want a replay of this, press the yes. If any of that, just press the yes on this webinar poll. Uh, it's going to be a great week next week, and, and I would just, again, uh, use that example that Chris gave of the driver that, that reported a couple of speeders uh, going past him. And sure enough, they're pulled over 20 miles down the road as a absolute example of a coalition between the motoring public enforcement and our industry to, to make our highways safer. And that's obviously what we're all trying to get to. Uh, I don't have anything else. So I'm look forward to participating in next week. Chris and Chris, I can't thank you enough for making our highway safer and the careers uh, that y'all have invested uh, to get to that point. Thank you very much, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thank you very much. Signing off.